We're all familiar with drone footage shot in movies or seen on websites of a remote beach or a city flyover or just a dynamic flight through trees or close to mountains. But have you ever thought about how drones are able to fly so well? Drones can really help you fly in lots of different ways. The good ones can stay stable in wind. They can avoid obstacles so you're not crashing it constantly. Some with the press of a button can automatically return to your location and others can fly autonomously from one checkpoint to another, even in certain paths or patterns to help you shoot some epic video. The question is, how can some drones help you fly like this? It's all about a drone's ability to collect and analyze incoming data. So drones, along with other electronic devices, have a lot of different kinds of sensors which can detect its motion and the motion of things around it. On the left-hand side are some acceleration versus time graphs that were collected using an accelerometer, and that's just a device that's able to measure the acceleration of an object. And these graphs right here were actually collected with accelerometers on a phone in the X direction, the Y direction, and the Z direction. Drones and other devices also have range finders or things that use sound. Sometimes they use light as well to detect how far something is away from it. And this is a position versus time graph and a velocity versus time graph that was collected using a range finder of a moving object. So drones can do all these fancy things because number one, they're able to collect quantitative data about their motion and the motion of things around them. And the software that the engineers designed are able to analyze the incoming data to do some pretty amazing stuff. So we've already seen some examples of this in class when we looked at the shape of position, velocity, and acceleration graphs for objects that were either increasing or decreasing their speed on the ramp. Um, we verified our predictions by looking at the position, velocity, and acceleration graphs that were collected by a motion detector. And a motion detector is essentially a rangefinder. It uses sound pulses to be sent out from the motion detector, bounce off of the object that's moving in front of it, and determine where it, where it is at specific times. So it creates a real-time position time graph, which can then be used to calculate and figure out the real-time velocity time graph and an acceleration time graph as well. In this class, we need to start learning how to interpret quantitative position and velocity time graphs. So given the shape of the position versus time graph that we saw in the velocity versus time graph, from each of these graphs separately, we need to know how to determine instantaneous velocity, average velocity, average acceleration, or displacement from either the position or the velocity graph if we had specific numbers. So as you watch this video, I want you guys to fill out your AP1 Unit 1 notes related to quantitative position and velocity graphs. Um, if you guys don't have the copy, it's linked in the video description. So we're gonna kind of take this one graph at a time to figure out how we determine instantaneous velocity, average velocity, average acceleration and displacement from either of these graphs individually. So let's start with instantaneous velocity. If we're looking at our position time graph and we have, let's say three times chosen, some initial time, some middle time, and some final time, how do we determine the velocity the object is moving at that instant if we had a quantitative graph? Well, remember, the slope of our position time graph is the velocity. So if we could find the slope at time zero, uh, this middle time and the final time, we could determine that. To find that on the graph, we'd have to draw tangent lines. So if we knew the slope of this line, that would be the instantaneous initial velocity. The slope of this line would be the second instantaneous velocity, and this would be the final instantaneous velocity. And if we go here, we can see that the slope is about zero. So just by looking at that, we know the instantaneous velocity is about zero. So how would we actually do that? Well, if we drew a tangent line like this, we'd have to draw on our graph two points on that tangent line, and we'd have to calculate the slope, the rise over the run. So we take this measurement, change in position divided by the change in time, that would give you the slope of that line, which would be the instantaneous velocity at a specific time. Well, let's think about how we would find instantaneous velocity if we had a quantitative velocity time graph. Well, this one's a little bit easier because on a velocity graph, the velocity values are specifically graphed 
all we'd have to look at is at time zero, what's the value of the velocity? That's the instantaneous velocity in the beginning. In the end, what's that instantaneous velocity? Well, it's on the zero line, so the final velocity would be zero. Okay, what about average velocity? Let's say we wanted to find the average velocity from time zero, or the initial time, to the final time. Well, we have an equation for that. Average velocity is equal to displacement divided by time. If we drew it on our graph here, right, from the very beginning position to the final position, that line represents the average velocity over that whole time interval. So just like the equation suggests, we'd be taking the displacement divided by the time, which is the rise, or in this case, the fall, <laughs> divided by the run, and that would give us our average velocity. Well, what about a velocity time graph? If we start at some initial velocity and we end at some final velocity, the whole time the velocity is changing. It's not staying the same, right? This is acceleration, in this case, a positive acceleration. But what would be the average of all of these values from the initial time to the final time? Well, it turns out that if your acceleration is uniform or constant, your velocity changes in a linear way, it's pretty easy to find the average velocity. It's just the midpoint velocity between the initial and final velocity. So if you start at negative four meters per second and go to zero meters per second, your average velocity would just be negative two meters per second. It's in the middle of those two things. And it, this is only true for uniform acceleration. In equation form, it just looks like this. You just take the average of your initial and your final velocity. So initial velocity plus final velocity divided by two. The easiest way to find the average acceleration of an object is by looking at our velocity versus time graph, if we have a quantitative graph. Remember, our definition of acceleration came from the slope of a velocity time graph. So if we just took the slope of this line, that would be the average acceleration. In equation form, right, slope is just rise divided by run. So on this graph, the rise is the change in velocity and the run is the change in time. So an equation to calculate acceleration is just the change in velocity divided by the change in time. And the change in velocity is final velocity minus initial velocity divided by the change in time, which is final time minus initial time. So if we have this equation, it turns out that equation will work whether we have information that come from, comes from a velocity graph or information that comes from a position time graph. Okay, so we could also use that equation that we just talked about here to calculate the average acceleration even if we got the information from a position time graph. So we'd have to take the change in velocity divided by the change in time. Well, that's the final velocity minus the initial velocity divided by final time minus initial time. And if you were just given a position time graph, you'd have to figure out the final velocity and the initial velocity using what we talked about up here, finding the slope of those tangent lines. So it would be this slope, the final velocity, minus this slope, the initial velocity, all divided by that change in time. And the last thing that we need to figure out and talk about is how do we find displacement? Well, it's easiest to find on a position time graph. Remember, displacement is defined as a change in position or delta x. So if we have a quantitative position time graph, the change in position is the final position minus the initial position. And that's something we already labeled up here. If this is the final position right here, this is the initial position, we take the change in that value. It's just the vertical measurement here on the position axis will give us displacement. It's maybe not quite as straightforward when we're trying to figure out displacement on a velocity time graph, but it's still something we can do. Remember, a velocity time graph tells us how the velocity is changing over time, but we figured out a way earlier in this unit to also determine the displacement given a velocity graph, and that was using area. Remember, if you take, if you shade in the area between the velocity values and the zero axis, in this case, we're gonna shade it in green, that area represents the object's displacement, how far it moves and in what direction from the beginning time to the ending time. And when we looked at this, we just applied that for situations where objects are moving at a constant velocity, so our area was a rectangle. But this also works when the velocity changes. And if we shade in our area here, now you can see that we have a triangle. 
And so we're going to have to calculate our area with one half base times height rather than an area of a rectangle, which is base times height. Okay, I want to talk a little bit just conceptually about what happens if our velocity graphs look a little bit more complicated. In the first situation, we have, let's say, not a zero velocity, but some initial velocity that gets even more positive. So this would be something moving in the positive direction, in increasing in speed, and it already was moving at time zero. Or let's say we had something that started with a negative velocity, so it was moving in the negative direction, and then it velocity approached zero, its speed decreased, and then after this time right here, it, its velocity is getting positive, which means it's now switching directions, moving in the positive direction, and the values are getting farther from zero, so it's increasing its speed. So how would we find the displacement, let's say the total displacement for each of these objects? Well, we could do that with these velocity time graphs using the area. So in the case of this first velocity time graph, <clears throat> the area looks like a trapezoid, right? Um, but my suggestion is split this, this area, this whole area represents the total displacement, split it up into two separate shapes. So to find the total displacement, we'd have to find the area of both the green triangle, one half base times height, plus the area of the rectangle, length times width. We added that together, that would give us the total area and the total displacement. In the second velocity time graph, in the beginning, before it changes direction at this, this point right here, this area is negative, so it has a negative displacement. And when it's moving in the positive direction, for that part of its motion, it has a positive displacement. So how do we find the total displacement if number one is moving backwards or in the negative direction, and then it's moving in the positive direction? Well, we'd have to add these areas, keeping in mind that the red triangle is considered a negative area because it was moving with a negative velocity. Anything shaded below zero, we're going to say is a negative area. And then we'd add that to our smaller positive area. So overall, there's more negative area than positive area. So the total displacement should be negative. So it would be negative one half base times height for our red triangle. And then we'd add that positive value for one half base times height for our blue triangle. To finish the rest of the notes, I want you guys to watch one more short video called Solving Acceleration Problems Graphically, and it is linked in the video description. Once you guys watch this, you'll have finished both pages of our notes, and you'll be ready to try and practice some constant acceleration problems.